committee back in 2005 on this very issue. And frankly, one of the things that held us back from doing everything we could have was Posse Comitatus. And I argue there's there's justification for working within the framework of Posse Comitatus. But in the case of the new NDAA, which was signed by the president uh, at the end of, of, of uh, December, uh, there's no justification. And essentially, just so your audience understands what happened, uh, the, uh, the president has declared that anywhere uh, in the world is now uh, a battlefield. That is to say that, uh, that uh, you know, where you're sitting this minute, where I'm sitting this minute, is technically a battle space, and therefore he has ultimate, uh, absolute authority to do whatever the hell he wants, whatever he wants, to, uh, to, to, to deem anyone a threat. And by the way, there's no oversight for how you, you go through a process of establishing uh, someone's potential uh, as a threat. Uh, and so uh, Bruce Fine is a, good, a very close friend of mine, a constitutional scholar, who has said very clearly that there, there is no legal basis for the NDAA to expand those level of authorities to the president. Now, there's been two clear abuses of this so far, uh, and frankly, it preceded the, the NDAA. One is the assassination of Anwar al and his son. Uh, they are U.S. citizens, and I don't care how you feel about them. I really don't. Uh, but the, the premise was, well, you know, they're bad people, so we should kill them. Uh, wrong answer. Uh, they, they were bad people, and, and they clearly violated the U.S. law, and bring them to justice. Justice means giving them due process. Well, you citizens. think you'd want to get a hold of them to get the so-called <laughs> intelligence, but expanding uh, on that, there you go. that sets the go. precedent to kill anybody. And that's my thing as an intelligence officer. I'm glad you brought it up because I always say, you know, I, I, I am for the idea of live captures because dead men literally don't tell any tales. So you've got to consider the intelligence value and why they're doing that, I believe, in the case of Anwar Alaki before 9-11. And I, Alex, frankly, you know, that that's one of the things that no one wanted to come out, that this guy had been a double, triple agent, and they were actually uh, working with him, uh, with the FBI. Colonel, I'm sorry to interrupt, but your phone cut out during that key point. Go back a minute ago, back to the beginning of Alaki. Start over. Oh, Alaki was actually an asset of the FBI before 9-11. So, frankly, Alex, one of the things uh, this, this administration was doing on behalf of all the administrations was covering their tracks. Anwar al had a documented relationship with the U.S. government and the Federal Bureau of Investigation preceding. This is before, that is before 9-11. So what they were doing, Alex, was going back covering their tracks. But beyond that now, beyond that, they have established, uh, my second point, a star chamber, if you will, where you now have at least four to five U.S. citizens, that is to say, people of our status, your, your status, my status, any status of a, of a U.S. citizen on the kill capture list. And no one knows how they got there, why they got there, what do you do to get yourself off the list, and oh, by the way, what justifies the unilateral use of deadly force when no one can actually define what, what they did that was so threatening to the foundation of the Constitution that allows them to be assassinated on sight. So this is where we're going with this. And, and I, I hope your audience understands this is not, uh, this is not theoretical. This is not uh, uh, basically someone uh, trying to drum up uh, an area which, you know, that, 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 that is fictional. This is truth. This is in the NDA. The language can be read by anybody. And the presidential signing statement, which he implemented, is say, basically he says, well, yeah, I've got this authority, but I'm not going to abuse it. And if you believe that, then uh, you believe all the other things the president has said over the past three years, which have never come through. So I have a real problem with it, and your listeners should, too. Well, just going back to the issue that you raised before, but I want to flesh this out. I mean, th this is illegal. Congress is supposed to authorize these military operations. And with the Libya situation and now with Syria and everything else, Congress is like, sure, we'll give you the authority. And Obama says, I don't need that and puts out a policy statement that he gets his authority from the U.N. I mean, it's bad enough for the president to say, I can do this on my own. That's obviously unconstitutional. But to say... I get my authorization from a foreign power made up of foreign governments. That that right there is treason. And, and that's what Mr. Fine has said. That's what many other scholars have pointed out. I know you're still part of you know, military and, 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 and government think tanks and things. So it's hard for you to you know talk about that. But well, what I'll, else I'll is it? Alex, uh, the, the, your, your statement is absolutely correct. I mean, the, the, president, the president's obligation is to, 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 to support and defend the Constitution. There's not a word in there about the United Nations or any of the foreign countries within our Constitution. So clearly, and again, I, this is why you and I have discussed this before, I, I, the, the whole Libya operation was illegal. Uh, no, no, no funds were ever approved for the president.
them to use them in operation, nor, nor was there any U.S. military authority to drop one bomb. By the definition of the president's belief in Libya, uh, we could technically use a, a tactical nuclear weapon on someone and never have to go to Congress for permission by, by extending the logic the president used to justify the quote-unquote air campaign only. So again, I, I agree with Bruce. Bruce has been on, and, and this is illegal. And this is not illegal in a small way. This is illegal in a very big way. And until the Congress grows a, a, a set of, of cojones to do something about it, you're going to continue to see this this un, uh, unfettered uh, expansion of, of, of presidential authority, which I would argue no matter who it is in the office, Democrat, Republican, doesn't matter. It's illegal. Wow. Uh, speaking of uh, the, the end of posse comment taught us all the things that are happening, it seems like with Obama – and Congress is going along with it to a great extent. They're just going for broke to try to set precedents to be able to get away with anything. Why are they so confident? Why are they so brazen when Congress has like a 9 to 10 to 11 percent approval rating, depending on which poll? Well, I don't know. This is one of those things that I, I think um, I scratch my hell. You know, I'm on the hill quite a bit dealing with staff and members. And I scratch myself all the time looking at the fact that Congress has been literally asleep at the switch of doing its job, which is oversight. They, they, they clearly have the responsibility of the purse. Uh, anything they, they don't, that they decide is not in the best interest of the Constitution of those people, they can defund. And so this is one of those things that I don't understand why they don't take a very strong position on things which are obviously illegal. And, they, and even if they can't do anything about it legally at the moment, they can defund it. So, you know, it makes it more difficult at least. And the second thing, and you probably know this, Alex, some of the folks I work with have actually sued the president over Libya. So, you know, you know, one of the things I think the president's counting on is that even if they catch him doing something illegal, he knows he's counting on the court system being very glacial and trying to uh, trying to track him down and, and force him to follow the Constitution. So I think right now it's just a brazen attempt to continue to expand the, you know, well beyond the, the George Bush issues. I think it's a continued attempt to expand the, the authorities and, and ability of the executive branch to, to do things without any oversight. Well, those that don't know history are doomed to repeat it. And I know you teach right. at war colleges and also to, you know, teach officers, but you know, but maybe some of the audience who's new doesn't. When, when presidents or, or the head of the Roman Senate, any time in history, start declaring they have all the power, every time this happens, look out. And I haven't seen anything like this since Lincoln, and that was a domestic issue then. Uh, this is, Lincoln wasn't siding with foreign powers, he just said, I have this power. And the courts have judged and Congress has judged it was illegal. You know, regardless of which side of that fight you know, people are on, it was illegal according to the Constitution. But Lincoln wasn't doing it for some foreign UN. I mean, when you, it's so amazing to see the president. And we're going to come back and get into uh, Iran. Uh, but I want you, when we come back, just briefly to uh, give me your take on what I just said. I mean, sure. the president says, I can do this because the UN said so. Uh, it is just mind boggling. Uh, his latest book is Operation Dark Heart, available in bookstores everywhere. An amazing read. He's uh, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer, and he ran the unit that could have killed bin Laden and was blocked from doing so. We'll be right back. Stay with us straight ahead. Okay, the world is going into a deep crisis. There's a man... The Bill of Rights and Constitution is being attacked. I want to get into Iran. I want to get into Syria, all of it, the situation with Russia, Pakistan. It's all just crazy with Colonel Tony Schaefer, best-selling book, Operation Dark Heart. A really interesting fellow. I sometimes I ought to just get him on about all, some of the wild things he can talk about and all the different operations he's been in. But right now, we were finishing up. Uh, if you just joined us talking about Obama says he can launch these wars because the U.N. says so, but they're not wars, even though they kill 35,000, 40,000 people. And it's just it's, it's reaching new Orwellian proportions. We know they're funding opposition with a lot of al-Qaeda connections in Syria. They're using al-Qaeda groups against Iran. Uh, all of this is just getting wilder and wilder. Uh, your points on that, Colonel? Well, I think, you know, clearly the, the Middle East is a bad place. There's a lot of bad people live there. And I think, uh, I may be very direct about this, I think we've had a White House who has been naive to think that, that being nice to everybody is going to be the ultimate solution uh, of bringing things forward. With a 
said, at the same time, I don't believe having the hammer. I mean, someone who has a hammer, everything tends to look like a nail. So, you know, what we've got to do is actually understand what is in our U.S. best interest. And as you pointed out, I think a large part of our government has been focused really here at home on non-existing threats, which really, you know, should make everybody really worried by the fact that they're, they're trying to establish so much authority to do domestic operations. And as we know, uh, there's been very few instances of domestic uh, terrorism, but most of those have been prominently uh, happened, which were actually of, of terrorist trade overseas. Faisal Shahzad, uh, Abu Mutala, the underwear bomber, uh, you know, uh, Major uh, um, the, uh, the guy of the uh, Fort Hood. Uh, Major Hassan, Major, all Major being Hassan. handled by the double agent Alaki. And, and, and yeah, so exactly. So uh, the threats are clearly overseas, and this is one of the things the administration continues to pretend otherwise. This also goes to the heart of the uh, the Iran, uh, Iranian uh, policy right now. Uh, we, you know, right now the the, the, the the president's speech Sunday to APEC really, to me, was a political speech. Uh, if he really, if he, President Obama, really believed everything he said, everything he said should have been something at the forefront of his, his policies three years ago. They weren't. So now we're left with a situation where uh, I think there's a number of folks who want to go to war. There's no doubt there's a, there's a divide within uh, both the conservative and liberal movements about what to do about Iran. Problem is this, Alex. Uh, there's a larger picture we're not paying attention to, which is the fact that we're about to see the beginning of a, a Sunni Shia Cold War. Uh, and, and, and so we're not even worried about the fact that there's larger powers, the Pakistanis who have nuclear weapons, the Saudis who have always wanted to have access to nuclear weapons, and now you've got the Persians in the form of the Iranians actually developing theirs. And all of this is going to play out in a very bad way unless we figure out who we need to deal with, you know, in both the long term and short term. And we're linking this directly to Syria. We don't know enough about the situation to actually side with someone, and yet we're involving ourselves. Much like we did in Libya, we chose to involve ourselves with, without fully understanding what that involvement would be. And I would argue that the tribal situation in Libya that exists today, with the foothold the toehold of al-Qaeda doing things on the ground there, was not what we intended. And frankly, it was predicted, though. And again, we're, we're dealing with an administration. No, you predicted it all here on air. Do, do, do we know what happened with the 10,000 missiles and 8,000 of them being high-tech? Well, we know some of them end up in Algeria. They were intercepted going across the border, so we can only imagine what happened to the ones we didn't see. It's going to be like the drug problem. You know, it's not the ones you capture that you have to worry about. It's the ones that you know are out there that you have no idea where they're at. So I think we're going to see long-term ramifications far, you know, far after this year. And then when jet airliners get blown up, taken off from the airport, I'm going to lose my liberties because right. they put Al Qaeda in Libya and gave them all these missiles. I mean, it's it, right. it, what you see is an excuse to power grab. Right, exactly. And so that's what we're seeing across the board. So but with that said, though, we've got to look at the fact that the, the, uh, the Iranians have been dealing with the North Koreans. And one of the things I think we talked about a little bit before is, look, the, the Iranians are just playing the same playbook as they did with the North Koreans. You know, the North Koreans did exactly what the, the, the Iranians are doing now. But the, the North Koreans did it back in the 90s. I actually worked operations and watched in slow motion as the, 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 the then Clinton administration basically gave in, gave food to the, the, the North Koreans, did all these concessions, never received a thing back. We're in the same situation now with the Iranians, where basically there's a, there's a game of brinksmanship going on, and we continue to kind of give things away with no expectation of actually achieving victory, which I would argue kind of goes to your point, Alex. The, the administration really doesn't necessarily want to achieve any progress by the fact they will consider to amass, you know, power to do whatever the heck they want. And I, I don't, again, I don't think they're defining clearly what the threats are we need to be looking at and taking action against. Well, when I see something in the Western media, I don't just believe it, but I went and looked it up, as you know, a couple months ago, I'm sure you saw it, where the head of the